But I have had some marijuana that turned me into a mathematician. You hear me? Shit that I couldn't do in high school, all of a sudden, I just woke up out of my sleep and just started doing chemistry and, and formulas. Hello there, love bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube and for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes you, can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's continue talking about Divided Soul. The Life of Marvin Gaye, written by David Ritz. Back in the studio in 1963, after his marriage, Marvin had began pacing the pack. He not only caught up with the others, but jumped out ahead with one significant exception. In June 1963, the same month that Medgar Evers was murdered in Mississippi, Motown had celebrated its second number one pop song the best-selling record in the country. Little Stevie Wonder's Fingertips Part Two, co-written by Stevie and Clarence Paul, was all the more unusual because it was a live recording, a virtual revival meeting. In July, Wonder released his first album recorded before Fingertips, in which he was called an 11-year-old musical genius. The record tribute to Uncle Ray introduced Stevie as the next Ray Charles. Meanwhile, in the summer of 1963, Motown's response to fingertips was typical. Crank out more of the same. If the gospel feeling was selling, then pour it on. By November, Holland Dozier Holland, Motown's most successful producer-writer team, had written, Can I Get a Witness?, whose title revealed its holy roots. Marvin recorded the tune minutes after hearing it for the first time. The song, a particular favorite of John Lennon's, was a hit. Gay's popularity was on the rise. A disc jockey tells the story of a mid-60s night at the 20 Grand, a Detroit night spot when Gay was due to perform while Gordy was seated out front. Marvin simply refused to go on, saying he was too frightened. Chow, my God, God. So what happened was, because you know Bird Gordy is famous for getting up out of his seat, going backstage, and disciplining his people. Child, the DJ said that Bird Gordy got out of his seat because Marvy Poo was tripping, smacked him in the face. Smacked him in the face like, ooh, like the Will Smithy and the Jada Piggy smack? Was it a open hand or was it a backhand? Burning with anger, Barry went backstage and smacked Marvin in the mouth. Oh! Woo, woo, woo. Then began cursing him out. The disc jockey said he'd never seen anyone reprimanded with such vitamins. Marvin took the punishment and a few minutes later performed. I would have got him back later. I probably would have performed. Oh, but I would have got that nigga back later. The next day, he would have had to find me. Matter of fact, for the next 13 days, he would have had to find me. You better tell your peoples to look for me. 
Because you ain't going to be able to find me after you didn't put your damn hands on me. And Marvin, how you allow this ninja that is not your peppy to smack you? Don't get me wrong. That Marvin will fight, okay? Because I didn't read some times where Marvin then jumped across the desk. And tried to wop pop dip it pop pop pow the Burry Gordy. Ooh, two fire signs calling at each other. Rawr, rawr. That shit was probably like fight to the death. That shit was like a cage fight, okay? Because you know neither one of them fire signs, they never give up. Usually though, his rebellion was not derailed. Soon as I had a couple of hits, I said, no, I don't want no charm school. I don't need no charm school. And no one's going to make me go. Being married to Anna, I got away with that attitude. Now I regret my arrogance because I think teachers like Miss Powell really had something to teach. Maxine Powell headed the Motown Finishing School. She dressed and groomed the Supremes. From a Broadway stage in 1977, Diana Ross introduced her as the woman who taught me everything I know. After a formal banquet in Detroit, during which Esther Gordy Edwards acknowledged Miss Powell's seminal contribution to the company's success, I, Mina David Ritz, met with Maxine privately. Now, let me tell you something. They round here spending money on a party for her, child, but they don't even have a retirement plan in place. David Ritz said she was a little upset that all, you know, she had done for the company um, was not rewarded. Because how you reward me, you know, for all my time at a company was my pension. She was quite bitter over the fact that she put a lot of work in, you know, and they depended on us. And this is how you treat us. My thing is the party. If y'all ain't got no money for no retirement, I know y'all have spent like $10,000 on this party. Brother, the party, just go ahead and put that thing to my account. I taught them discipline and also how to handle people. My philosophy was don't antagonize the enemy, obligate him. The kids had three main teachers. Maurice King, who taught them music. Charlie Atkins taught them dancing. And I gave them presents. How to walk, how to talk, how to hold a microphone. Mr. Gordy was interested in giving these young artists class. Marvin Gaye would argue with me. I'd tell him to keep his eyes open when he sang and he refused. Yeah, because when you on stage making love to me, I want your eyes to be closed. Cause when I think of somebody making love to me and on top of me, you know, eyes bulging out their head like this, you know, uh, 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 I'm not, I'm not turned on by that. In the beginning, Gordy depended upon strict teachers like Powell, King and Atkins to give his student singers a brand of professionalism geared to eliminate the smell of the streets. The instructors were 20 years older than the pupils and seasoned pros themselves. Typically, Gay went from extreme reliance on his mentors, Fuqua and Gordy, to fiery declarations of independence. Marvin was ready to break out in his own style. His ambivalence towards record executives, managers, and lawyers would increase as his career prospered. He resented needing them. Even more, a distinct sense of mistrust which ultimately, ultimately turned to blatant paranoia, became a permanent part of his attitude towards nearly everyone with whom he did business. Child, that be that booger sugar. Now, I don't know if weed make you paranoid. I ain't never experienced no, they, yeah, I think it depends on the strain. Do they got a strain called paranoia weed? But I have had some marijuana that turned me into a mathematician. You hear me? shit that I couldn't do in high school all of a sudden. I just woke up out of my sleep and just started doing paralliloquies and chemistry and, and formulas. In 1964, Gay was filled with praise and gratitude for the woman who had given him his advantage, Anna Ruby Gordy Gay. In turn, Holland Dozier Holland gave Marvin, you're a wonderful one 
which hit the charts in February. The song's simple story concerned a woman who gave her man courage through words of confidence, who lifted his spirit and pushed him ahead in an otherwise burdensome world. You know, because they be babies. All they need is encouragement, child. That's all them ninjas need is encouragement and somebody to believe in them and, and my wife. You know, I'm married to a grown woman. Like, how old is my wife? She's 41, but she's such a baby. Child, it's probably my fault because I didn't turn her into a baby. I sang all these songs for Anna, Marvin said. Before we actually married, I had struggled with the decision. It was something we both wanted, but also a situation where we could see the dangers. Anna and I were hot characters with hot ambitions. Because her ambitions was directed on me, it seemed cool. And once I started selling, I was overjoyed. Because her ambition was directed on me, it seemed cool. And once I started selling, I was overjoyed. Our plan seemed to be working. I was going to be the biggest star and Anna would get to be the biggest star's glamorous wife. Her thing was being Mrs. Marvin Gaye. She was pushing me to be the champ. In April 1964, Murray Wells, My Guy, crossed over and became Motown's third number one pop hit. Marvin benefited from the success because he'd just recorded an album of duets with Mary together. His first in what would be a succession of musical pairings with women. Gay's duets had enormous impact on his career. They elicited another side of his musical personality. He became the young black boy every young black girl wanted to date and love. White girls also got off on that stuff, Marvin said, but the times wouldn't let them admit it. I've always thought my white female following was extremely strong, though dormant. Women of all shades started falling for Marvin in greater numbers, not only because of his clean cut pretty boy looks, but also because of the peculiarly personal nature of the love songs he sang with lady singers. With this visibility, however, came problems. Okay, let me tell you what the problem was. The public was thinking, that the Marvy Pooh was hunting on the Mary Wells. We were both young and attractive people. So it started gossip, said Mary Wells. Are they going together? Anna was the jealous type to begin with, Marvin remembered. I guess I didn't make it any easier for her. I had all those hits and maybe I was feeling a little bit more confident. I was starting to feel my oats. After all, when women are yelling for you night after night, that does something to your head. Temptations were on the rise. I fell into a habit of taking a handkerchief, mopping my brow and throwing it into the audience. I loved watching the women fight over my sweat. It gave me a funny feeling, a thrill and a fear because I saw how much they really wanted me. Sometimes one of those women would actually run up on stage and throw herself at me. People laugh, but being sexually assaulted by a half-crazed woman is no laughing matter. The more success Gay enjoyed with female fans, the more his old childhood fears of women and his inability to satisfy them resurfaced. Child, I, I don't know. That man is going through all kinds of mental distresses in his mind. Marvin Gaye and Murray Wells were Motown's premier singers in May 1964. Only two months later, though, the situation shifted. In July, the Supremes' Where Did I Love Go and the Four Tops' Baby I Need Your Lovin' crossed over and ushered in a new era for Motown. Sales went from good to phenomenal. White people in droves were picking up the Motown groove and for the next several years, the Supremes and the Tops would lead the way to the bank. Mm. Though somewhat less spectacular, Marvin's hits didn't stop. Try It Baby in 1964, Further On, Baby Don't You Do It. A few months later, a Holland Dozier Holland borrowed a line from Jackie Gleason and gave Marvin How Sweet It Is. The tune was Gay's biggest seller to date. 
Still infatuated with Billie Holiday's Lady in Satin, Marvin asked Clarence to include two of its songs, You've Changed and I'll Be Around. There were also songs associated with Ray Charles and Frank Sinatra. You can feel the seriousness of Marvin's effort. If anything, he tried too hard, enunciating like Nat Cole, slurring like Sinatra, slurring like Sinatra. Oh yeah, Sinatra be drinking. That's why. Okay, uh, Sinatra, you know I love you, boy. You know I love you. Don't, don't, get, Sinatra fans, don't come over here attacking me because, in fact, the day that me and my sister were at the Kennedy Center, we were uh, there for Frank Sinatra. Okay, we were there uh, to honor. Frank Sinatra. His ballad style remained self-conscious and restrained. He held back feelings in favor of what he considered correct interpretations. The results were flat. Though on the up-tempo numbers, he swung effortlessly, demonstrating his natural feel for jazz. Marvin's musical craft showed signs of refinement. 1964 was the year that Dick Gregory, a later friend of Marvin's, led demonstrations in Atlanta. Three civil rights workers were killed in Mississippi. Martin Luther King won the Nobel Peace Prize and the Civil Rights Act was passed. Meanwhile, the music business was going through monumental changes of its own. The Beatles were arriving in America. At the end of 1964, with How Sweet It Is, a hit on both sides of the Atlantic, Gay returned to Detroit, flushed with success and grateful to Anna that his star was in ascension, but dangerously distracted by the screams of his female admirers. The women pilling at him from the first row. He feared them. He hated them. He sang to make them happy. He realized that they were the key to his fortune and the path to his ruin. By winning the hearts of women, his primary market, Marvin Gaye, was making money. Sometimes I felt like a kept man, Marvin reflected. But prostitution is a matter of deep personal interest to me. He rises when money is involved. Mixing money and sex makes for sizzling erotic stew. He keep telling y'all he like to buy hoes. He like hoes. The explosive success of the Supreme set Motown on its ear changing the very nature of the company, turning it from an oddity to a major factor in international pop music. Barry Gordy was already getting rich, Marvin said, but in 64, 65, the Supremes made him super rich. Thank you. 